right, hello everyone, and welcome to the Blake and Sal Show with Mark, episode four ninety seven in your wonderful hit books. And if you don't have a hit book, that's okay. We won't hold it against you. Hey, I'm Mark. My regular co-host Blake is in the hospital recovering from his colon cancer surgery that went really well. Uh, everyone that gave him sent him prayers and well wishes. We thank you all from the bottom of our heart. Here's the thing with this ugly disease of cancer. Not only does it affect the individual, but it affects the family, loved ones, and friends. And we're all in the fight together with this, Blake. And if you want to send him words of encouragement, you can do it through the show or our streaming platforms, all the podcast platforms. And also use the hashtag Blake Fights Cancer. Because you know what? Fuck cancer. And all types of cancer. It's a stupid ugly disease that affects everyone everywhere and i wish we didn't have it in our lives but unfortunately it happens and as far as sal goes the biggest heel in podcasting he's off on some personal business so i hope his day is going well and remember sal because of all these wonderful mistakes we're blaming this show on you okay so it doesn't <laughs> go right it's your fault all right and by the way just to let you know Sting likes me better. <gasps> so, and so I want to bring on my special guest co host, our wonderful, wonderful friend from the UK and from Bat Minute and Miami Minutes, Mr. John Parker. Hey, thank you so much. How are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing really good. I'm doing really good. Thank you for um, having me on as a, a special. I guess co-host. Um, I, I hate saying that because it feels like I'm stealing the show. But, you no, know. you're not stealing the show. You are a part of this wonderful show, this program, and we are better for it. And we have basically made some friendships along the way that we do this, and they're solid friendships. And who knows? Somewhere down the road, maybe I'll be knocking at your front door and asking you for a glass of wine. You never know. You know, I always have some because <laughs> um, I'm terrible. I always have at least one bottle downstairs waiting is for it, me. Is it sweet or is it dry red wine? I like dry. I'm not too into sweet. Mm. Uh, um, that's okay. That means you just put in more maraschino cherries in it to sweeten uh, it up. Well, that might actually be very nice. See? That could be a See, nice that, combination. That or a orange slice. Oh, okay, okay. Although, listeners... This is a rare occasion where I'm not sitting here recording with wine because I I don't know. I was in a rush. I finished work. I had to get here. I had to talk about wrestling. So I was like, no, the wine can wait. And it was a stupid move. The wine should never wait. <laughs> <laughs> that means it'll taste better later on. That's all it's going to be. Exactly. Think of it that way. Think of it that go. way. Although uh, I, I'll, I should deny everyone else their wine. I'll, I'm replacing Sal as the heel. So You're not allowed any. It's mine. Okay. <laughs> Actually... We should have sale buy us wine. Yeah, but that would be like a face turn. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, the wine he would give us mm. would not be good wine. It'd be mm. like two buck chuck oh, that you yeah. see at Trader Joe's. We've we've got yeah. plenty of that here as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think he's got a, a whole closet full of two buck chuck. Oh, uh, <laughs> nothing worse. It's either that or he it's right next to his GameStop stock. I don't know which one. <laughs> so before we get too deep into our show, just a few housekeeping items, plugs. Hey, uh, get my daughter's wonderful book. I know I am available right now at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and at orangehatpublishing.com. It's now in English and Spanish, and it's a good read. For parents to read to their children and for grandparents to read to their grandchildren. So it kind of covers the spectrum of the family. Mm -hmm. So no one is excluded. And also listen to the Dean and Mandy show available on all wonderful, wonderful podcasting platforms. Probably a popular one that you listen to. They'll be there. Now let's get into the wonderful why world of professional wrestling sports entertainment? Yeah. 
who wants to do this? Um, <laughs> I can edit this audio out. Me or you? <laughs> well, but I mean, so, for... un unfortunately, we have a couple of passings of oh. wonderful wrestlers that have passed on. The first is Ole Anderson, who passed away at the age of 81. Ole Anderson was best known with his brother Gene Anderson as the Minnesota Wrecking Crew. Uh, ben basically was part of the huge NWA uh, outcome that basically, you know, I don't say metamorphosized, but became part of Georgia Championship Wrestling, yeah. which later became WCW. Uh, basically known for with the Four Horsemen and J.J. Dillon. Ole was kind of like the big muscle behind the scenes and would uh, be heavy speaking and heavy handed uh, <laughs> and uh, always had something to say against his opponents, whether it was Ricky Steamboat, whether it was Dusty Rhodes, hey. whether it was tag teams. If you opposed the four horsemen and Ole was going to send you a message, it was the one warning shot, and then you better watch your back. Otherwise, you get what you get. I, I kind of uh, like that. I kind of love it. <laughs> yeah, and he's going to be very, very sorely missed. Um, you know, he's he was one of those persons that had that wonderful deep voice yeah. and could back it up with a good punch. So, I wish um, I was more familiar with him because I'm, you know, because of my age, I'm a little bit younger. Um so I didn't sort of grow up with him. I, I kind of got more into him checking out his stuff later on, you know, like in retrospect. Right. Um, but I always loved what I what I did see. I, you know, I went back and watched a lot of like Four Horsemen and things and, uh, and stuff yeah. like that. And it was always yeah. fantastic. Like, I mean, all, all of them. Every version of the Four Horsemen was good, but especially with him. Oh, yeah. I, and, and my thing is, is when they formed before they had J.G. Dillon, uh, Ole kind of knew the people that he would want in – this particular stable of wrestlers. Mm. And it was basically at that time, the cream of the crap, Ric Flair, the champion. Then he basically passed the torch on to Arn Anderson. Mm -hmm. Then it was Tully Blanchard. And depending on who you had, it was either him or Barry Windham, or, or I believe Sting was in at one time. Then it was Lex Luger, <laughs> but basically whatever faction of the four horsemen is in, Oli was kind of like, behind the scenes mouthpiece that if JG Dillon wasn't available at that time, Oli was the one that would come out loud and proud and basically taught the all the wonderful aspects of the four horsemen. And when they said that they're gonna come after a wrestler and they're gonna basically break you, the uh, they did. They did. <laughs> they came after you and they broke you literally with it break your arm, break your leg, break something. I but, always yeah. like that with, um, especially when, let's say, like wrestlers are presented as heels, because often a heel yeah. would be someone like, you know, quite a lot of the time they're, they're cowardly. But I like it when a heel's like, no, 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 I'm going to beat you up. And then they do, because that makes yeah. it scarier to me. It's like, it whoa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's it's like Oli was the guy that basically, out of the force, I mean, you feared the most because, you know, if you didn't, if you didn't watch your back or you didn't, you know, watch over your shoulder, you know, you turn around, he's there. Boom. Mm -hmm. You know, that's <laughs> it. One punch down, gone. Oof. Uh, another wonderful pro wrestler that passed away suddenly was Virgil, who basically oh. people knew as the bodyguard, the Ted DiBiase million dollar man in WWF, WWE, passed away at the age of 61. Uh, according to the information I got, that's from TMZ is that the wrestler Verger, whose real name is Mike Jones, uh, suffered from strokes oh. towards the end and also suffered from dementia. Oh. Um, and it, it's a shame. 61 is still very young uh, to go through this. But it, here's the thing that I think most people may or may not realize that being into life of pro wrestling sports entertainment is not all glitz and glamour that you think it is. No, there are other aspects that happen, especially when you either leave the business or you retire from the business. And if you leave a hard, you, you live a hard life during that time that you're working, uh, your health kind of takes a back seat to things because you have to perform 
335 days, 345 days of the year, and you get little time to rest and recuperate, except when you have a scheduled vacation, which is what, for seven, eight days? Yeah, and then you have to kind of rekindle <laughs> yourself with your family or loved ones and still doesn't give you the needed time that you need to recuperate from a lot of things that are affecting your body. And unfortunately, you know, this is what happens is when you step away and your health kind of catches up to anything, everything. And, you know, it, it's, it's a shame. It, it really caught me off guard as well, because, you know, obviously people have kind of been a bit mean to him over the years, I think, of making fun of him and stuff, you know, because he'll be yeah. at like, uh, you know, comic cons and things and he always makes jokes about oh i've got the biggest line and you know he doesn't mm -hmm. but he, he's just saying it isn't he? he's just being a character yeah. um but even so like even with all this sort of negativity and stuff i, I just didn't expect anything like that as you say he's still, he was still very young really 61 yeah. that's not that's no age that's yeah um yeah. and I, I didn't i knew he wasn't like at the peak of fitness but he didn't you know he never came across as someone unwell but that's you know, yeah, these things you know, are and, hidden and, a lot of the time, and, and and that's just it. Is that, um, especially when he was in his heyday with working with WWF, WWE, and you could tell that the fans wanted him to break away mm. at PBS and basically be a babyface and go against him and challenge him and take the million dollar belt away from him, and just when it looked like that the people were going to get what they want. <laughs> Pull him back in. He, he still make him a heel and still a bodyguard for million dollar man. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I remember time... I wanted him as a face because I loved him as yeah. a kid. <laughs> yeah, and, and the vignettes they had with him and Ted DiBiase, oh yeah, they're a hoot. I think the best one that people remember is when Ted DiBiase officers was a young boy, so much money to dribble the ball ten times. <laughs> yeah, he's on stage. And all of a sudden, he gets to nine, and Virgil kicks it. <laughs> sorry, kid, you don't get the money. I'm sorry. You I know. love that one. I only just rewatched that a few weeks ago. <laughs> you know, so I mean, and then Virgil did show up later in WCW with part of the NWO, um, but he was one of those that was kind of more took a backseat. wasn't in the limelight. He was more the backseat. He was like the B team of the NWO that if all the main contributors were busy, yeah. well, here you go, here's the B team, and we'll send the B team to beat up whoever. So, well, if you remember but, at the time, they actually did the on camera, they started calling it the NWO B team, didn't they? Which yeah. was a bit strange because, well, it's like NWO black and white, NWO red, NWO. <laughs> Which it's like, you know okay, what? As, as much as I loved loved him, um, what was he called in WCW? Vincent was it? Um, yeah. As much as I liked him, I don't think he should have been in the NWO. I liked it more when the NWO was kind of more exclusive. You know, it's like, oh, it's the it's the biggest stars yeah. from, from the other company, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. When, when they start putting in well, uh, anyone, it's a bit, it's not as effective. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if you looked at it, it was like the NWO morphed to like all the heels in WCW, and then all the baby faces were against the NWO, whichever group you want mm -hmm. pick a group this week and then you can pick another end of your group <laughs> next week you know because there's so many <laughs> yeah i i often wonder if they went by the free brood rule when it came to like take teams okay we'll take this person out and then we'll put this one in your place but we still are going to defend the tag team championships it's still the nwo it's still part of the family they did do that a few times uh, they yeah. didn't do it like all the time but i remember quite a few instances where yeah like someone was injured so they'd just go uh, steiner you're the tag champ now come on <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, did that and uh i think that the, the, the moment that st sticks out in my mind with nwo is when we had hollywood hulk hogan go against kevin nash and was for the title Ah. And basically, Hulk Hogan gives Kevin Nash the poke of doom. Yeah. Uh, it it the, seems funny on paper, but in practice, no. no, no. It, 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 it was the most foolish and embarrassing moment in professional wrestling. And Kevin Nash talks about it. And unfortunately, it was something that came up to be done by the powers that be, naming yeah. Eric Bischoff and Hollywood Hulk Hogan. And it just didn't 
go over no. as they thought it would. I think in in theory it's okay because you sit down and you go, yeah, that'll get me so much heat, like treating the belt so disrespectfully. But then when you actually see it, it's like, no, no, this doesn't land. This is a terrible idea. No, no. <laughs> it may have been good on paper, but when you put it past that, no, no. <laughs> but uh, no. So uh, we have some talent changes in some organizations. Mm -hmm. The one that surprised me and I shocked the heck out of me is Matt Riddle in New Japan. Yeah, I was thrilled about this because I, I haven't really watched WWE regularly for a long time. And I didn't think he was going to go there by any means. So, the, you know, I watch uh, New Japan. So I was like, wow, oh, my God, Matt Riddle. Because I love Matt Riddle. <laughs> Matt Riddle, same goofy kind of guy, <laughs> different hairstyle. But I think what it is, is when he gets into the ring and has that mindset, he becomes that that type of animal where yeah. I'm Matt Riddle, MMA. I basically kick your ass. I'm not even going to think twice about it. And, and that, that's what I love, that he can flip between the two kind of yeah. uh, attitudes. And he had the match against who? None other than President Ace Tanahashi. Yeah. And he won the New Japan World Championship at New Japan beginning at Sapporo Night 1. I I bet you, I bet you nobody saw this coming. No, absolutely not. No, no, no. Because you, you just assume as well, because Tanahashi only just won that, I think, um, a few weeks yeah. ago, if I remember. It's quite a recent yeah. change. Um, yeah. And I, I, there's a, Matt Riddle's a bit of an exception, but someone we're going to be talking about in a minute. You assume people coming from WWE, oh, if they're going to New Japan, I mean, they're not going to give them a title because right. they're not that kind of wrestler. It's a different style of wrestling. But Matt Riddle, mm. he again, he can straddle the world, can't he? Because he essentially he can just do the strong style type thing as well. Yeah. So they probably yeah, thought, and... oh, brilliant, yeah, like stick it on him. Yeah. He can bridge the the gap between the the sort of you know worlds, so to speak. Yeah, and, and here's the thing with Matt Riddle is this guy can adapt. Yeah, you know, if, if you think that he just plays this goofy type of wrestler, he'll adapt. I mean, he'll do MMA, he'll do Muay Thai, he'll do Roman Reco, he'll do catch, he'll adapt. And that's the thing with him is that I think people forget about the type of background he's got, and he when he does do it, it just surprises people. But I'm, I was kind of wondering who is going to take the title off of Tanahashi so that way he basically sticks to more responsibilities in behind the scenes part of it. And now we know who it is. Yeah. So now the question is, is Tanahashi going to challenge Riddle down the road to get the belt back? Or is there another contender that's going to step up and take it? That's interesting. I always prefer it when there's one rematch. Um, like and then then say if if Riddle wins again, that then settles it. Like oh okay, it's not a fluke, you know. Yeah. It's uh, he deserves. He's the champion. He can then go forward. I always like it when there's at least one rematch. So my thing is now that Riddle has entered New Japan, is will this be a way to make sure that Riddle stays and doesn't jump ship? Mm. Oh, are they going to kind of is this like a trial thing to see where it goes or what? I think it might be the, the latter. I think it might be a kind of a trial, like see see how the Japanese react. And it could also be setting up, in a way, getting him in an AEW match for like Forbidden Door. Mm. Because obviously some of the big hitters in New Japan have left and they're going to AEW anyway. So it's not really Forbidden Door. They need some people to send. And although he's not Japanese, that doesn't matter. You know, they, I mean, they sent Will Ospreay. <laughs> he wasn't Japanese. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you've got uh, Tamatanga that has left, and mm. you've got Okada that has rumored and big rumor that he's going to sign with AEW. So, I mean, yeah, the forbidden door is going to be open, and the only thing that I could see Riddle going down the road for would, and that is if Orange Cassidy still has the belt, oh. is Orange Cassidy's belt. Oh, that and would be good, actually. Yeah, New Japan. I mean, well, because that that belt, the original idea of that title seemed to be that it would travel around a lot. 
you know, because yeah. um, initially it was getting defended, you know, all over the place in like different yeah. promotions and things. And yeah. Cassidy did defend it in another promotion like here in, in the UK recently. Right. But it's not happening a lot, is it? So it would be kind of cool if oh. um, someone took it away for a while. Yeah. I mean, that'd be a great matchup. Matt Riddle, Orange Cassidy. Yeah. I, I, that. Wow. I'm into that. Ooh, ooh hey, hey. <laughs> matchmakers, let's put it in the play. Let's make a deal. Come on. Yeah, hell yeah. Let's do it. Come on. What yeah. are you doing, Tony Khan? <laughs> and Yeah, Tony, come on. <laughs> Tanahashi. Oh, Tanahashi, <laughs> set something up, man. Come on. <laughs> Work your magic. You know, do I have to tell you how to do your job, TK? I guess I get something. I don't know. <laughs> come to us. Man. We're better. <laughs> so then another unexpected title change. And for the love of me, I I thought David Finley basically was going to be the person that I would never expect anyone to knock off. But newcomer Nick Nesmith beat David Finley to win the IWGP Global Championship at New Japan World New Beginning at Sephora Night One. Nick basically you saw in TNA now is going to be in New Japan. Yeah, yeah, I, that that caught me by surprise as well. I thought I thought for him, especially because a couple of years ago he said he wanted to kind of do less work. So I thought, oh well, TNA, he'll just he'll just do TNA. That's fine. That's right. great. But no, he's gone all the way to Japan. Wow. And and yeah. it's like I'm not a big fan of David Finlay. I don't hate him or anything. I like him. I'm not. A Big, big fan, though. Um, but I didn't see... Uh, this is another one. I didn't see this happening. No. To give the title... Because this is what I was meaning before. Nick Nemeth, love him. But he's a WWE-style wrestler, right? Which you mm -hmm. don't get a lot of in Japan. It doesn't always translate that, that kind of, you know, of wrestling. But they obviously see something in him to be like, you know, have a run with it. Let's see what happens. I, you got to look at it, it thinly adjusted. And Finley, you know, kind of adapted strong style. Here's the thing, Mr. Nemeth, you know, welcome to Japan. They strike harder, they kick harder, <laughs> they throw harder, they flip harder, they come at you harder. And if you're not ready for it, get ready. Yeah, yeah. Everything is harder. I mean, it, I, <laughs> if you look at some of the chops they do, and the welts they leave on that person's chest. <laughs> oh my God. The blood vessels break right away. And if you keep chopping, you're then they show a picture. Your whole chest looks like, as they put it, red meat. It does. It does, doesn't it? You know, <laughs> and if you're not prepared for that, Mr. Nemeth, then you better get in the do training dojo and get prepared and put a lot of liniment on your chest because you're going to need that, my friend. I'm, oh my I'm god! I'm very torn on my, on that when people do it, right? Because on one hand, I get it's it's Japanese sort of wrestling culture; it's their style, yeah. And they they like it. It's sort of like um a bushido, like a way of the warrior kind of a yep. kind of a thing. But I also sort of am on Bret Hart's side when he, when if you've heard him talk about it, where he says like, well, why do they do that? It's stupid. You're not actually trying to hurt each other. You're supposed to be pretending to hurt each other. So I kind of get, <laughs> I kind of agree with Bret. It's like, oh wow, okay, that is actually damaging someone. Ah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, not there's bad blood between some people. At times there is, but I think what it is, and when you have a newcomer, okay, let's welcome him. Yes. Let's show him what we're all about. And then he'll get the message that if he tries to basically, <laughs> you know, kind of like overstep his bounds, well, I guess we'll have to put him in his place. You know, they it, they do that quite a bit in Japan as well. Like yeah. they do it with the with the uh, young boys, don't they? Like they put oh, them through the paces. <laughs> oh yes, definitely, without a doubt. <laughs> and that's how the young boys kind of become like, okay, we have to get into this mindset. We have to get into this this great physical shape. We have to be able to to take the hits, take the blows, and yeah. get back up again and act like it doesn't hurt, even though we're going, oh, my God. <laughs> Which is why it's, it's interesting to see Nick Nemeth at this stage of his career go there. It's like, oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Like, I, mean, I want to see him versus Tanahashi. That'd be quite cool. Oh, definitely, without a doubt. I think and... they'd mix quite well. Whereas if he went up against some, like, really hard-hitting, strong-style guy, that might not blend so well. I don't know. 
Well, him against Ishii. There you go. There we go. Oh, okay. You've changed my mind already. <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> That's not one I, I ever expected. How, I just want to see how long Mr. Nemeth is going to last. <laughs> Uh, that, to be yeah. honest, I think pretty much any match you throw him in is going to be good. You know, <laughs> he's a good wrestler. He was always underappreciated, I think, over over the years. I know he's had think, he's had titles, but he's had more I, talent I than was, that. Yeah, I think he, it, towards the end he was like underutilized. I mean, when he was with the Dirty Dogs with Robert Roode, and then Robert Roode's on the shelf, and he tried to kind of jumpstart him in his singles career, it didn't kind of go over really well and i think he was no. just underutilized and that's why they kind of let him go and from what i'm hearing when vince made the decision to let him go it was more of well you know he's getting to that point where he's in like his mid 40s and you know it's kind of hard to do you know going like 20 and 30 minutes and i'm just going you know you're gonna regret letting some of this talent go because they're gonna come back and bite you in the butt and absolutely yeah mr Nem is that type of person where he'll recreate himself and get the attention and it happened in tna and now it's gonna happen in new japan and, and who knows down the road maybe triple h will be on the phone going hello nick hey you know do you want to come you know, can you help us out, buddy? I could you see know? that happening. I could absolutely see that happening. Yeah, you know, it's like, you know, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Mm -hmm. And you especially know? because now that Triple H seems to have more power, yeah, he does seem to be doing stuff like that. Like, in fact, this, as of recording, quite a recent um, development was the, um, the Sean Spears thing. Yes. He's gone back. And I didn't think he'd ever go back. No, no, I I didn't think so either. I I kind of thought that maybe, you know, people in WWE would look at him going to AEW as being like damaged goods. Like, well, yeah. you know, Tony Khan's got him, and Tony Khan's doing this with him, and do we ever want him back? That now that Tony's kind of had him, and well, exactly. Yeah. And they let him use his AEW name and persona, which is a big step. Because if you've noticed, everyone that they have brought in like that, they've allowed them to keep their presentation. Um, like you know, Cody, Jade, people like yep. that. Which I think that's a that's a big move. Because in the past they would have just completely changed the character. Yeah. Now they're I mean, like, okay, no, no, trust us with you, trust us, and they're proving yeah, that the I trust mean, is there. You know. I, I think why they're doing it that way is more so for the fans because if you're used to having a wrestler and war organization and we'll give an example like jade carhill okay and now she leaves AEW, comes to wwe she's still jade carhill and yeah. basically the fans that she had in AEW will follow into wwe which will give wwe a broader fan base Definitely. and probably sell more merchandise absolutely that's the thing although i don't watch much wwe i'm gonna praise them it's a good move. It's smarter for everybody. Because if they kept doing stuff like that, it, I would be like, oh, okay. Maybe I'll check out what they're doing at the moment, you know? Because <laughs> here's the, the feather in the cap of WWE is when Cody came back, was with AEW, came up with the name The American Nightmare, Cody Rhodes, walked in the gimmick like he, he's usually doing now in WWE, comes out with his weight belt, throws the weight belt into the audience, and in AEW, the audience threw the weight belt back. Oh, yeah. Oh. Now, in WWE, he basically takes a well -built weight belt, autographs it, kisses it, and gives it to a kid, and the kid is all excited. Yeah, so, I love seeing that, to be honest. I do, because I like Cody, and I always remember yeah. as a kid, I wanted Bret Hart to give me the glasses, you know. The glasses, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, Natalia's kind of doing, you know, yeah. kind of following that. But, I mean, so that's something that they're doing. They're, they're realizing that if you want one wrestler in an organization to come to yours, probably let that wrestler keep the name for yeah. continuity's sake. Because why confuse people when you know, hey, this guy was in the AW, now he's in WWE, you know, 
you're not going to try to lie to people. You're basically going to have people going, look, we got this guy in our organization. Come yeah. see what he can do for us. Look at all the stuff we can sell you. Look at this. Buy this, sense. buy this, buy this. Makes perfect sense. Sad, it do, sadly, doesn't work the other way because I, I, I'd really like to see Dolph Ziggler in Japan rather than Nick Nemeth, but there you go. <laughs> well, I mean, here's the thing. Um, when you're in New Japan and you have a name like Dolph Ziggler, <laughs> you're looking at, well, maybe this guy should be like part of the Chippendales review or something. Yeah, yeah. With a theme like that. <laughs> but when you come up with Nick Nemeth, it's kind of like, well, okay, you we're on the independent circuit. We know what you can do. So show us what you can do. Uh, yeah. So, I, I mean, but yeah, Dolph Ziggler. I, I swear to God, I think they got that name from a Chippendales dancer. It, it, it 1,000% sounds like a, like a stripper yeah. name, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, or, or some porno stage name. I <laughs> so now the change is everyone remembers Mustafa Ali in WWE. Hey. Well, Mustafa Ali has gone to TNA, and he beat Chris Sabin to win the TNA X Division Championship at TNA No Surrender. Kudos. Yeah, that's to great. Mr. That's Ali. Because I love him, but I actually didn't want him to go to AEW because, and I mean this in a positive way, because I think AEW have too many guys like that already. So he'd just be another one. You know what I mean? And he doesn't yeah. deserve that. He deserves something like this. He deserves to be, you know, really moving up the card and doing well and winning titles and things. So uh, uh, TNA was the perfect uh, choice for him right at the moment. Because hey, I think, like you said, A and W, he would get lost in the shuffle. He would yeah. get underutilized. And when he went to NXT for a little bit, and basically got a jump start and everything, and he was showing everyone what can do, and, and then some. I also think he was showing the younger wrestlers in NXT, like okay. This is what you should do. This is how you should do it. This is how you should present it. This is the package you should present it in. Yes. yes. So I think he was basically showing these younger wrestlers, this is what you need to do to basically make this work. And it shows because you see a lot of the younger wrestlers on his team come in with not only great acrobatic skills and being in great shape and great cardio, but the promos are better. Their packages are better. They basically put the whole thing out better. This seems like they're more self-aware and have self-confidence in their character and how they want to present it to make it to where you're going to either get that big pop mm -hmm. or you're going to get a lot of booze. One of the two. And if you get nothing, then you know you're in trouble. <laughs> Well, I think he actually, he surprised me over the last couple of years. I, I didn't realize in the past how effective he is at storytelling and at character work. Because when you see yeah. him, you're like, oh, is he just like a flippy guy? No, no. no. <laughs> He's actually got a lot of charisma and personality and he can do promos and everything. He, he's got all the goods. Yeah. So kudos to TNA. They're getting a great guy and let's see where this is going to take them. Hopefully. He's going to take it to better and bigger things. You know, the biggest thing that would be would be Moose, and if he gets a shot at Moose, God bless him. Oh, that would be that would be interesting, wouldn't it? Those two against each other. I'm trying to picture that match in my mind. How would they fight? It, 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 you kind of look at it like a David the Goliath match, but here's the thing: you know, he don't need a slingshot. <laughs> He's got everything else in his arsenal that Moose can't do or won't do may not do because moose is relying on his you know big brawn and big body mm -hmm. and you know i'm moose big and bad and look at me well you know sometimes it doesn't always get you the paycheck into the pay window no no exactly i could see i could see mustafa ali beating him that'd be quite cool actually yeah. I, that's now my my wish list <laughs> i mean yeah you can think of that and then you can have save and challenge him for the big title Alex Shelley ch challenged them, you know, all the people that, you know, made TNA something like Alex Shelley and Chris Shaben, Saban and, and other things, people like that, where, you know, people kind of look at them like, I don't know where that, I mean, here's the thing, 
ladies and gentlemen, do your homework. Google the Motor City Machine Guns. Yeah. Watch their matches. And I'm telling you, these guys, workhorses personified. Absolutely. If you want to talk about excitement, if you want to talk about electricity, if you want to talk about action, Motor City Machine Guns, Google it. Watch your matches. I guarantee that if you blink, you're going to miss something. I swear to God. Yeah, they back in the you know earlier days of TNA, they were probably my team. They were the one I liked the most. Oh, yeah. yeah. And now we come to uh, <laughs> Sal, I hate to say this. I know. I think Sal's going to be wearing an, a black armband when we go through this. Is Aww. Coming up, AEW Revolution. Yeah. Sunday, March 3rd. Where it's going to be headlined by an icon's last match. We'll get into that, but let's look at the card from top to bottom. Da-da-da-da-da. Woo! -da 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 -da. Uh, okay, I don't know if Tony had a hand in this, but meet madness match. <laughs> I couldn't believe it when I saw that graphic. I was like, wait, what are you doing? What? This is brilliant. This is fantastic. <laughs> what the hell are you thinking? Meet <laughs> madness match. Are, are you trying to basically kind of jump on like the March madness thing and trying to expand, expand on that? Is that it? I, you know, I think if, that's what if, they're doing. Yeah, a, a play on words instead of March Madness meet Madness match. Okay, all right. <laughs> well, let's go for it. Let's. The participants in this wonderful match are Wardlow, the master of the power bomb, Woo. and his symphony of power bombs, versus Powerhouse Hobbs, master of the choke slam and body slam. Versus the Murderhawk monster, Lance Archer. A plethora of mean, ugly <laughs> nastiness. What's hey, big what meaty man slapping meat? There you go. That's what it's going to be. You know? You, you, you know what you're getting. <laughs> That's it. So out of this wonderful triangle of all these players, who do you see winning? Ooh. Right. To me, to me, there's only one person who realistically should win. I'm sad to say it because I like them all. They're all great. It's a bit weird that they're all heels, though. I, I don't really understand why three heels, but OK, whatever. Yeah. Um, but really, you've got to give it to Wardlow, surely, because he's in a storyline. He's in a faction who mm. I like the faction, but ever since mjf's gone they've had nothing to do so get some wins win something come on because <laughs> if what well, lance archer right i adore him i love him if he wins what's it what's what's going to come from it well nothing. besides jake coming out that who knows because wasn't he joining a faction jake jake and him with, with so, um the righteous so yeah supposedly when they had uh Vincent and and yeah, they look like they were going to be, but then all of a sudden they stopped it. Yeah. You know? And okay, so now you got Power Hob, Powerhouse Hobbs, who's with the Don Callis family. So I mean, it's not inconceivable to say that possibly the two factions, the kingdom. And Don Cal's family having a feud? You could, but they're both heels again. That would be a bit strange. I don't know. Yeah, Unless but... you turn one of them, but that's, that also doesn't seem right at the moment. Yeah, I mean, that's the whole thing is with Adam Cole, baby, leading this group and Don Callis leading the other group. Yeah. You know, you would you would like someone to kick Don Callis' ass, <laughs> besides Chris Jericho. <laughs> You know, I, mean, I, mean, I could so... see Wardlow maybe turning face and leaving the group, but it still seems too soon. But I could imagine yes. it maybe happening, yes. but not. I, yeah. Don't turn Powerhouse Hobbs. He's always better as a heel. Oh yeah, it definitely. You know, and unless, unless 
a recruit world to join the Don Callis family. You could do. You could do. But then the, the people who complain about AEW, you know, jumping around the storyline, you know, they'd complain about that. <laughs> but that's, I mean, and this is unheard of where you've got three heels into a match and, and going against each other. And we're proving the point of what, who's the strongest, who's the baddest, who's the meanest. Is I mean, if that's where you're going for. But at, yeah. at the same time, I, I agree with you totally. But at the same time, I like the idea of these three having a match. I have no problem with it. It, it makes me think of, you know, the undercard on New Japan uh, events. Because they, yeah, well, they just throw things together. And that's oh, yeah, fine. Yeah, I always yeah. have a good time with those matches, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, here we go. You say Wardle, I, I, I have to agree with you. I mean, if you want to go into a storyline and... War, this would be the way to do it to expand the storyline and break out Wardlow to basically either pin Lance Archer or Powerhouse Hobbs. I I'm just hoping that none of the rest of the factions get involved in this. Yeah, and it becomes an all bra where it's everyone gets disqualified. I especially yeah. don't want that if this if this card is 100% accurate and that's the opening match. I hate right. it when the opening match doesn't have a conclusion. Yeah. Save that for the middle. <laughs> I mean, you want to you want to open this this wonderful triangle of if you want to say man meat <laughs> and to basically get your attention, and get you excited and get the blood blood pumping yeah. for the match that's going to follow. I mean, which is which to... is why matches like this are really good to start off a car. You know, ones right. that don't necessarily have a lot of story going. Because it's just a, it's it's almost like the opening band when you go see a show. You know, they're just getting That's your it. blood pumping, as you say. Well, you know, or you, you go to a show and you have a comedian that's opening for the main act, and yeah. you you want to make sure that the opening comedian doesn't bomb because if it does, then you're kind of wondering, well, if the opening comedian bombs, what's the main guy going to do. Yeah. It know, brings the atmosphere down, doesn't it? Yeah. How do you recover from it? Now you got some mean comedian that's got to come up and basically heckle the opening act that wasn't good. So, I mean, this is, this is going to be good. Yeah. It's going to be a slug fest. It's going to be a slap fest. <laughs> and yeah, I, Wardlow's got to, they got to prove himself with this one. I think so. I think it's important to oh, give yeah. him a good outing. Yeah, especially because lately go. he hasn't had too much to do. <laughs> yeah, he, well, besides pushing Adam Cole in the wheelchair. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so now the next match we have is FTR versus Blackpool Combat Club with John Maxey and Claudio Castanoli. Uh, oh. I don't know. I, I think you can flip a, a coin and go either way yeah. on this one. Uh, you know, my heart goes to FTR, but I think Batpool Combat Club, I think, has to win this one in order to prove a point. Hmm. Yeah, you might be onto something because I was the same. I was very torn on it on how to decide. Initially, I was leaning towards FTR, like, oh, yeah, they might give you, um, like a, a feel good win there. Uh, I don't know. I think you might have hit the nail on the head. I think to prove a point because that's kind of their whole thing isn't it and yeah. and they might do it in they might be a bit untoward they might cheat well not cheat but they might be a bit extreme behind the referee's back let's say <laughs> yeah you know i mean you, you gotta prove the point that basically you're here to uh kick ass and take names and whether you collect titles or not is you know no difference to you you just want to basically beat up people and this is what you do then FTR would be the, uh, I guess, the stepping stone to do that to, because yeah. FTR is known for rough and tumble tag team wrestling. And if this is where you want to go, then you got to beat FTR in order to get that next step. That I think that could be what the what they're going for. Um, maybe to establish Moxley and Castagnoli as a team because we we know they're in the same faction, but they don't often tag together so maybe this Correct. is to like solidify it in your mind of like oh no no now they are a tag team because at one point i know that they want to go after the trios titles with brian danielson well the, the, what's weird about that is still danielson doesn't interact with the others very much no so i mean if if he, 
if you want to have contenders for a tag team championship, this would be the the two people to do it to put belts on. Yeah, you know, to kind of basically reward them for beating up and kicking ass and going, okay, you know, we beat this team, we beat that team. So, you know, the only thing for us to do is basically win the belts and basically trample on people and move on. So, I mean, if this is what they're looking to do, then they got to beat FTR. I think so. And it would make a big statement because if you beat someone like that, it's like, whoa, definitely, (laughs) definitely. Uh, the next match was going to be, we've talked about it, Will Ospreay, easy for you to say. Um, <laughs> I say because this is going to be Will Ospreay's breakout moment with AEW, I say he's going to win hands down. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think when you're coming into an organization from New Japan into AEW and they're putting a lot of media press behind you and money behind you and you want to make a good impression this is the way to do it is to beat someone from the don Callis family and to make a statement make a point that okay i'm here i'm here for one thing one thing only i want to win the championship belt i want to be the number one guy mm-hmm. and for me to do this i have to knock this guy off absolutely you're totally right i agree will osprey um uh, for all the reasons you've just listed he's he's the big thing He's regarded possibly as the best wrestler in the world right now. So to start him off day one, because I know he's wrestled there before, but not as part of the roster. So that's separate. Right. Let's forget that. So this is his day one, really, because I he's, he's not going to have a match before this, is he? So, you know, um, you don't give him a loss. The only way I could see him losing, the only way they might spin it is because you he's affiliated with the family, Don Carlos family. And so is Takeshita, obviously. So right. maybe he's about to win and Don Callis gets annoyed and they jump him or something. But that that wouldn't be satisfying to me. I think it would kill his um his his heat a little bit, you know. So I mean this is another from the mind of Tony Khan. <laughs> this is something where you got two people from the same fraction battling each other. Mm-hmm. Now my thing is we all know that Will Ospreay has got other intentions involved that basically I don't think he's going to be the yes person for Don Callis. Will Ospreay has never been that type of person where basically he's his own man and basically you're not going to tell him anything differently. Yeah. So if this is a way to prove himself, not only to Don Callis, but to, to others, then he's got to win this match. If not, then it's going to look bad. He's they're, they're going to, he's going to look like he's, ill-prepared and he can't take on the big challenges and he chokes when the big time comes exactly uh, you know so I, down the road i see will osprey leaving the don Callis family and strike out on his own or he takes kyle fletcher with him yes that's what i was thinking he, he takes him with him you know because he had his own faction already just keep that going um i could see him leaving the don Callis family on this night because you could turn him face. They know the fans are going to cheer for him. Oh, he's yeah. going to get a big pop. So yeah. turn him face in the match. Do what I said, right? He's going to win. Don Callis jumps him, but he sees it coming. He counters it. He beats up Don Callis. Then he finishes off Takeshita. Takeshita can take the loss. It's fine. It won't affect him, really. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to rankings, I, I don't know where he stands, Takeshita. But here's the thing. You know, from what I understand, I think, Kyle Fletcher has got his visa problems worked out. I think everything is all corrected. Mm-hmm. So here's the thing. I would say that Kyle Fletcher, he's going to be the the question mark, the enigma that basically will he make an appearance or won't he? And if he does, I can see him eating Will Ospreay. I can oh, see him yeah. and Will having their, their, their faction back together and they're only missing the third piece of the triangle for their faction and it's just going to be a matter of time before he recovers from from his injury and yeah. then you got the uh, you got the faction back and i think that's what everyone is waiting for and i think that's what they want to do and 
I think it, they look at it, if it worked in New Japan, it can work in AEW. Yeah, I mean, and obviously, you know, AEW being founded by wrestlers from New Japan, they get it. They understand. Like Some people criticize AEW. Oh, there's too many factions. I like it because it's a Japanese style of doing things. In Japan, you've got to be in a faction. Yeah. Like, everyone's yeah. in a faction. And, and the thing is, is the popularity of everything in New Japan, I think Tony Khan wants some of that to trickle down into his organization and yeah. the way he's doing it is by this way. And the fans in new Japan are also going to follow his product because you have wrestlers going back and forth. And if the fans are going to stick behind the wrestler, they'll gravitate to your organization. They'll watch your programming just to see what their favorite wrestler is going to be able to do mm-hmm. on any given night. And case in point, will Osprey. And I, I'm telling you right now, Will Ospreay is not going to disappoint. No, and absolutely. I don't think Will Ospreay is the type of person that would want to come in, especially on a pay-per-view, on a debut, and lose. Yeah, no, you, you, you're right. I, as much as I like a surprise, I can't foresee any Osprey loss in in a positive light. No, no. So just just Tony Khan, do just do what the people want this time. Okay. Tony Khan, Tony, do the right thing. Do it. Do it. Do Plus, it. you know, Will Ospreay, he's English. So yeah. you know, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> then the match that we have coming after that is Eddie Kingston and Brian Danielson, as Brian calls Eddie the king of the bums. <laughs> but yet you got a bum that has three titles. Explain that, Brian. <laughs> that doesn't happen by accident, my friend. No, no. Although no. I'm still, I'm still a bit confused by this title. Well, the, you know, the continental crap. Like, why wasn't? I think people have said this before. Shouldn't the international championship have been the AEW part of that? Wouldn't that and have made more sense than making a new one? But, but you you're, know. you're and you're you're preaching to where I asked the same thought I had. <laughs> or my thing is, why couldn't you make it a trophy? A trophy yeah. that basically, when you have the tournament again next year, you take the name plaque off and you put another name plaque on it. Make it a trophy. You know, I like and, it when they do that, like with the you know, you know, the Owen Hart. I thing. mean, look at New Japan. Yeah. I mean, trophies and the the wonderful celebration they have with it i mean you could do the same thing and eddie kingston's been in new japan and he has mentors in new japan that basically have fought him so i mean why not them making the title making the trophy but you know yeah oh, oh but I, I don't know it's strange it's strange i like it in a way my idea was just don't make a new one put the international hence the name international that's the right. point <laughs> So maybe down the road that Tony may be looking to morph the two belts. That would be good, yeah. You know, and, and just make it the one title. See, that would be that would be cool. I would like that. Because I, as, as a big nerd, I play a lot of, like, wrestling video games. Right. Uh, and ones where you're, like, the, you're in charge, you're the booker, you know, like, really yeah. statistics and yeah. things like that. And I always set up my company to be like, okay, each belt, I don't mind having lots of belts, but I like them to have a purpose, a right. gimmick. Because why, in theory, if if this was all totally legit sport, right? Why yeah. would you choose to go after that and not one of the others? I, I always like it when there's an explanation for, okay, well, I want to go after this because this belt's for the best technical wrestler or whatever, you know? Right. And I think they're trying to foster that kind of thing with this, where it's, this is a tough, strong style kind of belt. So I like that idea. Right. And, and then this match proves it. Eddie Kingston and Brian Danielson, they, they're going to beat the crap out of each other. <laughs> oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. And I don't know the animosity between the two, whether it's generated or whether it's real. I think sometimes it's bleeding over because I don't think to give Eddie Kingston enough credit for what he's done or accomplished yeah. or how he's done. I think they look at him as basically um, a total enigma 
that he's kind of like comes in, tries to kick butt, tries, you know, he's got his one finishing move. But I think Eddie's going to surprise you because I think with this match, he may pull up a submission move to try to have Brian tap out. Oh, that would be cool. Because I was actually going to say, I think Kingston wins. Um, because oh, so he's, do I. he's quite new to being the champion. We know Brian Danielson's like, he said publicly, I don't really care if we have belts or not. It doesn't matter. Um, and it's that stipulation. If Danielson loses, he has to mm-hmm. shake Kingston's hand. Right. I think that's where it's leading. It's almost like a, you know, he's doing he's doing his um, retirement tour almost, isn't he? So he's like, well, I'll put right. you over. I'll shake your hand on TV. You're great. Right. <laughs> now, 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 here's the thing. And you brought it up. Yeah. Brian Danielson has said that this is kind of going to be his final year and he's going to be working less and he wants to spend more time with his family. It wouldn't make sense to put not only one title on, but three titles on him, if that's the case, because I'm not sure if all titles are going to be defended in it. That's something else I don't understand yet. Is this the one or the three? That's just it. Eddie says yes, but Tony is the one that says, we'll see. (laughs) But I know we're going to put one title online for sure. Yeah. And I don't see a title change. And will Brian shake his hand? I don't know. I I think you what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to have Claudio. You're going to have to have John basically physically hold his hand out and make some sort of contact. Ah. And then everyone walks away, supposedly. But then what happens is the whole Batpool Combat Club jumps on Eddie. Ah, And then you have the rest of the locker room spilling out to go up against the all force of the Combat Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> the Blackpool Combat Club. But here's the thing. Where is Wheeler Yuta? That's true. We haven't seen him for a while. Has he been uh, he's been injured, hasn't he? I think. I, I think so. I'm not sure what what extent, but here's the thing, you know, they're always kind of like bad mouthing Wheeler Yuta. Yeah. Does yeah. Wheeler stick with the Blackpool Combat Club? Or is he going to find an ally in Eddie Kingston? Oh, That'd be cool. I mean, we're, we're expanding to have even more factions here, but I like that idea of uh, Kingston having a faction too to fight the combat yeah, club, or, or or basically like someone like a mentor, yeah, or Wheeler Yuta, because we that thought that's what hate. Danielson was going to be, but he barely speaks to him. <laughs> no, it's like you know you don't see a lot of interaction because I supposedly Brian says I'm going to be the one that's going to show him how to do strong style. I'm going to be the one to show him how to do submission. I'm going to be the one to show him this and. Okay, well, Brian, show me. Yeah, show us, show us, show us, show us, Brian. What are you doing? Come on. So, for <laughs> the AEW International Championship, we have the champion Orange Cassidy versus Roderick Strong with Matt Taven and Mike Bennett, and the rest of the wonderful <clears throat> Undisputed Kingdom. <laughs> so, here's the thing. Is the Puppet Master going to work his magic? Is Adam Cole going to work something where basically Orange Cassidy goes down? Or is something else going to happen? I I think title change. I think this is one. Because Cassidy's had, he had that one amazing run with the belt. This one's not been as good, but it's still had some quality matches. But I think now is the time as well to make the Undisputed Kingdom, make them a threat again. They haven't been a threat since the MJF thing. One second, Johnny, got Check what my dog is doing. <laughs> no worries. Okay, all right. You want to get your food. Give me a second. 
it's weird. I'm on my own. Do I talk? Do I stay quiet? Oh, <laughs> I've been staying quiet. Sorry, Blake, because I don't know what to do. It's unusual. It's unusual. Da -da 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 -da. I had to move the kids out of the way, blocking the food. Oh, <laughs> my, my, I look at this, this particular match is Orange Cassie has been on a roll and somehow he's found a friend in Jake Hager recently. That's true. That was just, that was a surprise. So I can see Jake Hader kind of coming in and trying to even the side but i don't think it's time yet to put a belt on roderick strong oh, okay okay i i mean it's our first disagreement of the night how dare you <laughs> i mean it would be the first belt within the faction and is see is it gonna be roderick's belt or is it gonna be the group belt and yeah. basically, would Adam Cole like wear the belt over his shoulder? Oh, that'd a be la fun. Christian Cage, like he did with uh, Kill Switch. Yeah, I don't know. He could do that, and it would be fun. But as you've just pointed out, we've already had it quite recently. So, so I mean, do you do it again? I don't know. He says, here's the thing. If I expected anyone to get a belt in that faction, I would expect Wardlow. Yeah. You know, I mean, because he's the person that right now uh, has made an impact, and I think he would go well in the rankings, and I think he would basically be in that contendership spot. Roderick Strong, I you know. I get what you're saying, and you could maybe put Ward maybe Roderick loses, and you put Wardlow in a match with Orange Cassidy as like revenge, you know? Yeah. But I also I, I I just like the idea that now's the time to remind people that Roderick Strong isn't just the guy shouting Ada! <laughs> <laughs> as great as that is. There's more to him than that. We know he can go, and he hasn't had too many opportunities to do that in AEW yet. I I think if you want to prove a point with Roderick Strong, you would do it without Matt Taven and Mike Bennett to say, hey, yeah. look, this is what I can do. I don't need any help. I can I can basically knock out Orange Cassie and myself. Um, also, you know, this would be the way storyline wise to basically say, OK, now Orange Cassie has a time to heal up all his yep. injuries and then come back and then challenge Roderick strong at a later date for the belt, which would be good. Cause remember last time he lost it, wasn't it to heal up and then plans that to change. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> quite quickly, it, you know, it is a possibility that Roderick may win. So you have convinced me sort of to change my decision hey, to Roderick okay. strong. But at the same time, don't feel like you have to change your decision. We we, no, we are no, allowed I, to have different I, I, ideas. I, I look at it in in the full aspect that okay, Orange Cassidy, Orange Cassidy, he wins, he wins, he wins. Okay, and what? That's the thing. We what else? He's he defended do? it a million times already. You know. Yeah. What else? What else can he do? What else do you want him to do? Do you, I mean, you know. If you you want him to basically be remembered for a match, okay. Here here's something. Put him against Okada. Oh whoa whoa yeah yes yes, because too many if, people if, still like sleep on Orange Cassidy. They don't see how good he is. Right. I mean, if you want to basically have Orange Cassidy need something with the belt, you got to put him against a heavy hitter. Okada would be the person, and if he loses the title to Okada, then there's no bad feelings, no ill will, saying, okay, Orange Cassidy, you tried it, you did your best, but on this particular day, Okada just beat you with a little bit more. 
that would be yeah. good. And you know what? Okada is someone who would elevate the belt. Like Correct. if he wins the title, you're like, oh whoa, okay, it's it's a it's a real deal kind of title. Because then I could see him challenging Ishii and other people with the forbidden door being opened and possibly challenge Mr. Osprey. Oh yes. This is brilliant. And that's what or, they could mean by international. Or, They're not gonna take or, it. Away. Or Walk in Zack Saber Jr. Oh, 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 oh. Don't, don't that would be my heaven if he joined as well. Oh, God. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, I, I think you you gotta do something when Okada comes in. You you've gotta make him go for a major title to basically get that get him noticed, get him to that point where a title is going to mean something around his waist. And he's going to defend it. And he's going to defend it against the heavy hitters. Yeah. And no, no disrespect to Orange Cassidy. He's been doing a, a, a great job. But I think the steam is running out. Yes. And yeah. the popularity that he used to have, especially when you play the music and the best friends theme comes in and everyone is kind of, you know, putting hands. Uh, Trent in storyline is kind of questioning or now he wants to stay in best friends. Yeah. Chuck Taylor is injured. Rocky Romero is kind of hit and miss. He does his own kind of thing. So the only thing left is makes sense is for to take the belt off Orange Cassidy and let best friends kind of repair their friendship or see if they splinter off. Yeah, I mean, they could splinter off. You could technically completely... I have heard no rumors, people. This is just off the top of my head. You could have Okada found his faction. You know, Chaos. Uh... What if he makes, like, Chaos USA or something? And you could Rocky Romero can be in that. Or, you know, he could pick Orange Cassidy instead of the best friends, and it would be controversial, you know? Yeah. Any Anything is possible. And here's the thing. With Okada coming in... <laughs> everything and anything is possible and i wow it, <laughs> it, it, it when he when he makes his appearance and, and he is all elite you're gonna see shit happen and i think people are either gonna be stepped up they're gonna step up or be stepped on yeah absolutely because here's the thing Okada is going to have a target on his back, and I want to see who the first opponent is going to be that wants to basically kick his butt. Um, I, I've got my idea. I don't think that it probably will happen. Okay. But, okay. I mean, <sighs> my thing is when MGF comes back is to have MGF versus Okada. Oh, oh yeah, you've got. I think they have to do that quite soon. That would be amazing. Everyone will love it. That's going to bridge the two worlds again. You you bring in you know the Japanese yep. style. MJF's a bit more of the, you know the Western style. But yep. they'll they'll flow together yep. well though. It won't be like a yep. mismatch. Yep. And and if you want to get have MJF you know climb the ladder again. That's the way you do it. Definitely, definitely. I'm into that. Oh, I love your so, idea. <laughs> now we got the TNT Championship. God, this is still a championship. <laughs> this is this is the to me, it's the forgotten championship. Because yeah. basically you have a TNT championship for TNT television, then you have the TBS championship for TBS television. One is female, one is male. E why he was created, I have no idea. I think it was just for the sake of the uh, wonderful television <laughs> networks. I have to say, hey, we got champion. Well, um, but I, what I would do, much like I said before with my video games, right? Slightly rebrand it. I would take that title and be like, okay, it keep the name, that's fine. And because of the name, it's basically it's a TV title, right? So I would put, I would put a short time limit on the matches. Yep. Like I'd say maybe the matches are ten minutes. Yep. And you have to defend it every week. There you go. 
That's the gimmick. That's what I would do. And it'll have lots. It'll be the hot potato title. There'll be short range. You know, John, that is old school thinking. And it works because that's what they used to do old school during territories. Exactly. You have a TV championship. You defend it week after week. You're on 10 minutes. You're on 20 minutes. You defend it. And basically what they do is they figure out a contender for you. They throw them in. Yeah. You win one week. You come back next week. And, you know. I love that. I love that thinking. Tony, Tony, hey, hey, Tony. If <laughs> Come you're on, man, do it. And you have your ears on. Here you go, buddy. And it would give it a purpose, right? Because, again, in the world of AW, right, if you're a wrestler, why are you picking to fight for the TNT championship over the international? What What's making you go for it? If you yeah. want to prove I can f- fight week after week, that would be the title to go for, right? That would be the good gimmick. There you go. There you go. So we've got the wonderful champion, Christian Cage, who is head of the patriarchy. <laughs> God knows. I don't know who came up with the name. And frankly, I, I <laughs> uh, just, I, this must have, this had to come from the mind of Christian Cage. That's I think I, it did. I absolutely think it did. And it's like a blend of two things, isn't it? It's because A, he always talks about fathers. And yeah. B, you've got all the patriarchy jokes in the Barbie movie. So I think he just went, hang there on, what go, if we see. mix those two? So then he's going to be with the Prodigy Nick Wayne in Kill Switch and Mother Wayne <laughs> against the wannabe Chippendale dancer, Daniel Garcia. Woo. Yep. So <laughs> here's my look on this. Daniel Garcia has gotten back up from Danny Magic and some other wrestlers. Do I see a title change coming? I would like to say yes, but if it does happen, I think I would like Kill Switch to break away and mm-hmm. to get the championship. Yeah, I don't see him putting on Daniel Garcia not now not at this time only because oh who else does dan garcia got when you got this big faction here that you're up against that's it basically you know if you if you do beat christian cage and you you got him down on the ground you know are the rest of this is wonderful brood gonna come in and kick your ass I know Mother Wayne's got this wonderful arm that goes right between your his legs. You know, and it's just... She's really embraced it. I've loved seeing how she's joined in with all this. She she has she has morphed into this mother. I'll be damned, and you know, I'm gonna basically do my damnedest to make our team win. And yeah. if I have to put one between your legs, so be it. <laughs> it's fantastic. And, and and you notice she smiles about it too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's almost like like she was she wasn't involved in wrestling before, was she? But she it seems like she has been. No, I, she I she was I think more involved with her son and her husband as far as you know, kind of giving him moral support and encouragement. But I think now she's taken that to another level because if you notice, Nick has been silent. Yeah, Nick is basically doing what Christian tells him to. Now, here's the thing: Will Nick do the same thing if Mother says, "Nick, do this because Christian told me to, and I'm telling you to mm. do it"? You know, I mean, mm. here's yeah, here's the thing. I mean, Christian's large and in charge, but you know, sometimes when Mommy says something, <laughs> it gets done. And I could see that being sort of like a bit of Nick Wayne's character of like, yeah, he, he listens to his mother. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like, now I'm in a conflict. Do I listen to, you know, my artificial dad or do you listen to my real mom? <laughs> Although, while I agree and I love that, I still don't think it will affect the outcome of the match personally. I'm I'm, I'm going with Christian Cage because yeah, I, I, it just seems weird to throw the belt on Daniel Garcia from out of nowhere. Yeah. You know? I, I, I see Daniel having more of a trios belt than a single belt right now, or part of a tag team than yeah. put a singles belt on. Well, also because like technically Christian's still got his thing going with Adam Copeland. Like I know they're not interacting much, but it's because Adam right. Copeland's doing his open challenge thing. 
But that's all to build up the wins to get back at Christian, isn't it? Correct. So, said, so, so my thing is to put a belt on Daniel Garcia would kind of negate, you know, Adam Copeland's storyline. Unless Copeland comes out and costs him it, maybe. And then they can keep their feud going or, and Daniel Garcia can take the belt away from the feud. Or, yeah. or Adam Copeland comes in to help Daniel Garcia so he doesn't get his butt kicked after he loses the match. Yeah. And now that kind of sets up some tag team match down this road where you have Christian and you pick any other one of your wonderful, you know, brood members. It could be Kill Switch. It could be Nick Wayne. I think know, it should and, be Nick Wayne because then it would be Christian and his young boy against yeah. Adam Copeland and Daniel Garcia could be his new young boy. <laughs> there you go. See? Yeah. See? That's... That's positive thinking. Yeah, it's like the next generation. <laughs> yes, there you go. And here's the thing. I, I think the match between Nick Wayne and Dan Garcia would be really good because then you've yeah. got younger wrestlers that basically want to make a name for themselves and showing them what, the, what each other can do. And, you know, Nick Wayne, it, it has, you know, Darby Allen has commented on how Nick Wayne wrestles and, you know, all the movies he does and everything. And we've seen what Nick Wayne can do. And this is why it kind of bothers me a little bit is that you don't get to see much of Nick Wayne do much in this particular faction. So if you have him in a tag team and we all know Christian doesn't like to work a lot. No. And basically <laughs> does, has Nick do all the work against Adam and Daniel, you're going to see what Nick Wayne can really do. So maybe we got something down the road where you got a tag team. And if they win the tag team, then I can see Adam saying, now I get my shot at you, Christian. Yeah, exactly. There you go. There you go. We've got it. We've nailed it. We've got the storyline down. There we go. See? (laughs) Why doesn't Tony hire us? Jesus Christ. I know. God, I don't know. Tony, I'll do it for cheap. Come on. There you go. <laughs> now we got uh, EEW Women's World Championship with Timeless Tony Storm, who's the champ with Miami and Luther <laughs> versus the Empresaria, <laughs> Deanna Prazo, who we found out through storylines, our friends were wrestling together, and now they're not. And now... We want to see who beats who. Um, do you think it's time for Miss Perazzo to have a belt on her? No, right? I love her. I absolutely love her. She's one of my favorites. But I don't think it's time to, A, give her a belt yet in AEW. She's still quite new uh, uh, to the company. And B, I don't think it's time to take the title off Tony. Her popularity is sky high. Like, she won some award for, like, the best the best gimmick the other day yep uh, and i think to me she's my favorite gimmick in all the wrestling male female whatever it doesn't matter to me i just love tony storm i could see some people not liking it and that's fine too that's fine but i think the majority it seems to be people are very high on it so i don't think take the title off it yet like that would just I don't know, again I, I always try and see the other side so maybe you could use it as an excuse to make her even more crazy but i think she's crazy enough <laughs> uh yeah without a doubt she's playing the character very well um i would kind of agree i i think there's no particular reason to take the belt off of tony storm no at least not yet um yana has just recently come into the organization and you've got other established female wrestlers that I think would be more of a con- better contender. Um, example, Ruby Soho. See, that would be fantastic. Um, they're and trying it would make to sense. do that story. They're trying to do that storyline between Tony Storm and Ruby Soho, and I think that would be great to put a. You could put a belt on Ruby. That'd be fabulous. Yeah. I mean, you know, or Thunder Rosa is roaring back. You That's know. True have a match between Tony and Thunder Rosa. Uh, we know what Thunder Rosa can do, um, and I think it'd be great. Um, Agree. And I think Deanna deserves a title at some point. I just think she now. hasn't had 
any like standout matches yet, but which is fair enough no. because they've mostly been you know establishing her and things. So. You know, I would rather see her wrestle someone like Akira Shida. Oh yeah. Uh, or Nyla Rose. Mm. Or here's one, Tyler Valkyrie. Oh, that would be very good. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and get her feet wet and more established. And that way, you know, when the time is right, if Tony still has the belt, set it up again for that. But absolutely, like a rematch for you would being be better, a new yeah. kid on the block to come in and say, "I want to be the champion," and not ruffle feathers. Good luck with that. <laughs> I'm also intrigued, like what's happening with the Mariah May storyline, because every week basically she asks Tony to watch a match, and Tony's like too busy, or, or it's some reason she can't watch a match. So or, are they, are she these, lies I, about it. I assume they're setting up at some point. Mariah turns on it. I mean, th that would basically look the way the storyline is going to, though whether or not that actually happens. And here's the thing: what do you do with Luther? Even though he's not doing much, what do you do with Luther? I just like having him there. He does. He just has to stand there and look like he does. I think it's great. I mean, <laughs> his facial expressions are just phenomenal and then he's there to back up the catcher and all this you know i mean that, that's great it's the best but, work he's done <laughs> i mean mariah may i see her fitting in more with julia hart oh that'd be interesting yeah yeah because in um in stardom she was in a faction i can't remember what the faction was now was it julia's faction i'm racking my brain I'm forgetting. I'm a very forgetful person when it comes to but, this. I but, think she was she was in a faction in Japan yeah. for a bit. And, so, um, yeah. So, but now is not the time to take the belt off, right? No, right? Not right no, now. No, no, absolutely not. Oh, so. this match we're gonna love. AW World Championship: Samoa Joe versus Hangman Adam Page, who people have said they got him looking like Magnum TA, which I can't lie that that that. It, so the visual is very close, the mustache and the hair. I'm into it. Um, it works for him. It's given him a different sort of vibe. <laughs> now, what? Who's? Who this? He what? Yeah, we're finishing up. Why? What? We're 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 gonna be finishing up. Why? What's up? Okay, if you want to do that, that's great. Is he falling asleep? Oh, okay. Well, okay. Well, we'll finish and then he can. Okay, what? Okay. Okay. Cool. All right. Great. Okay. 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 Just leave your car on the street because I got to go out and get supper for tonight. All right. All right. All right. Okay. Love you too. Bye. Bye. It was the boss's wife. Hey. Once we were still recording, say, so yeah, we're finishing up. So. Well, we started late, you know, because of all the other yeah, issues. Yeah. Well, there you go. So. <laughs> so then we got uh, then we have him facing Swerve Strickland with Prince Nana. Yay. Yeah, and his little dance. Yeah. <laughs> I, sw I swear to God, I, they gotta name that dance. The Nana Shuffle, I guess. Yeah, oh. that I'm into that. Because yeah, I don't think it has a name, does it? No, it doesn't. Or well, like maybe the Swerve. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> and then the wonderful backup dancer she had. Yeah, that was. Brilliant. Is he going to make an appearance on the pay per view? AEW usually go all out for pay per views, so well, possibly. There you go. Yeah. Okay. I I am perplexed by this match though, only because, uh, you know, Swerve has shown me something and has come up in the rankings so mm -hmm. is adam page but 
Samoa Joe has not done much of anything since he's gotten the belt. No, 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 no. Um, and I'm not sure if that is the kind of a buildup for him or if he's got some underlying in, injury or, or what, but I haven't seen him, you know, like officially come out and challenge someone and say, okay, you know, I'm going to challenge you for this. We're going to, you know, ex except with this match. And even with this match, you had him complaining that he's facing two guys. Well, yeah. if you got Tony saying they're both number one contenders because there wasn't a definite winner of their match, you know, if the boss says it, then the boss says it. So, yeah. and here's Jeff's the normally thing. the kind of wrestler he wouldn't mind. He'd be like, fine, bring it on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, Hangman has had the title before. Swerve, he's kind of like the enigma is if you put the title on Swerve, what would you see him doing or what direction would he go? Um, I guess he could uh, continue knowing, his feud with Paige, but we've seen it. Wow. Well, you know, we've seen the violent feuds and how the blood is spilled and everything. And, you know. <sighs> Plus, I, I know I said this for Tony. But I'm going to say it again here. I think it's too early to take it off Joe. You're right. He hasn't done too much with it. Yeah. So I'm hoping they've got something in mind. You know, do something. Give him some. He's had some great matches. Don't get me wrong. But he hasn't had the match or the feud of his reign, you know. Yeah. He hasn't had that definitive match that yeah. everyone expects. Um. Here's the thing. Hangman and Swerve, I think, are going to cancel each other out. Because of their storyline hatred for each other. And Joe's going to pin the weaker of the two and retain the belt. Mm -hmm. Now, what you do after that is open to things that you got Tama, you got um, Okada coming in, you have Osprey coming in. Do you want to basically keep the belt on Joe, which is a safe bet? And basically, when Okada and Osprey come in, kind of work them up into the rankings to basically give that good uh, opponent feel against Joe. That'd be good. Although I would like to see Osprey versus Strickland. That'd be good. Ooh. You have now struck up my curiosity, my friend. Mm, that's yes, the kind of matchups that, we want. That, there, see? There we go. I mean, if you want to go up in the rankings, that would be great, you know? Because it eventually, I think what would come down the road would either be a Samoa Joe versus Okada match or a Samoa Joe versus Osprey match um, to basically have the belt change hands. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. And in order to do that, you want to legitimize, legitimize both those individuals in the rankings. So to take the belt off Joe right now, it, it's not – as he would say, not good for business, especially when you got two well-known wrestling stars coming into your organization and they want to make a mark. And the only way to do that is go up in the rankings and challenge the champion. And if you challenge Samoa Joe, there you go. Absolutely. Yep. So now we come to the match that is very going to be very emotional going to basically leave a lot of blood, sweat, and tears all over the place. And I'm not ready. I'm not ready. Uh. Yeah, neither shall I are ready, but oh. officially, and this is official, this will be Sting's last wrestling match. And I think we can and trust AW, Sting, unlike Ric Flair or someone yes. like that. <laughs> unlike Ric Flair and, and uh, what's the name? Uh, Funk? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, Dory Funk. Yeah, I think when Sting says it, he means it. Yeah. So, and this is coming from Sting. Sting says this is his last wrestling match. Period. He's not going to wrestle for any other organization. He's not going to wrestle anymore. Uh, and it's a tornado tag team match with Sting and his apprentice. People are calling him Darby Allen. <laughs> and supposedly, originally, it was supposed to be Ric Flair in the corner, but. As we've seen through storylines, 
Ric Flair had a talk with Matthew and Nicholas Jackson, the Young Bucks, and I have a strange feeling that Mr. Flair <laughs> may change allegiance and side with the Young Bucks. Right. I've got another idea. I've got Go ahead, my friend. Idea. Maybe I'm think overthinking this, people, so maybe I'm wrong. Flair changes allegiance. He comes out with the Bucks, and you're like, oh, God, no. He's going to screw Sting over one last time. Maybe it's a ploy for Flair to catch them off guard for when they try and cheat. He can get one over. He can screw them over for Sting. It's all a trick. <laughs> Ah. Now, I might be overthinking it. That might be overbooking WCW no, style, you know? No, that's not overthinking. Believe me, that's not overthinking. Because um, it's putting someone in their camp, like, to watch them, you know? Here's the other thing, too, is when we last left you with Young Bucks coming in and basically kicking Sting and Darby Allen's asses, and they have put on their wonderful white suits, which... They said they can't get out. And <laughs> I they love the way they brought... keep wearing those. Yeah, yeah. And two of Sting's sons come in, and they get trounced by Young Bucks, which hard to believe, looking the size of Sting's boys. Um, Maybe this is the comeuppance that Matthew Nicholas get, is Rick looks like he's befriending them, but like you said, turns on them, but then Sting's sons kick Matthew and Nicholas Jackson's asses all over the place from each pillar to post. Yeah, yeah. And that would basically be a good send-off for Sting's last match, knowing that his family comes to his aid. That'd be good. Yeah. Kicks their ass, and everyone goes home happy. I actually do think that you're onto something. I think they might do something unusual in wrestling, and He'll go out as the champion, as a winner. I think they're going to make the fans happy here. Because uh, oh, the Bucks winning, it would be nuclear heat. It absolutely would. But oh, I, th definitely. I think they're going to do something different, and they're going to be super respectful and be like, no, 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 let's let you retire as a champion. You're Sting. Anyone else? Okay. Most people retire, you know, looking at the lights. This is Sting. Right. <laughs> it's not any wrestler, you know. Right. You know, and, and to honor Sting's legacy in the wrestling industry is to let him keep the championship, let him go out in a blaze of glory, mm -hmm. and then you can always basically have them turn in the belts yeah, and have a tournament to determine – who do you want to be the next tag team champions? And we all know AEW love tournaments. So, and yeah. the thing is, you have a lot of talent in your roster to form tag teams to do this. So it's yeah. not like you're hurting for talent. You've got the talent right there. What better way to showcase your talent by having a tournament to determine who's going to be the new tag team champions? I think they're going to do it. I think that's what they're going to do. Um, against everyone, everyone else is saying online, "Oh well, of course he's going to lose. It's tradition. It's tradition. That's what." Or you do. I don't think that's going to happen. Or the power mad young bucks do one thing that basically is going to set off the crowd, and one thing only mm. is because they're their boss, <laughs> mind you, and the referee is there. No. They're going to have the referee because Ric Flair is going to basically somehow knock Darby Allen out. They're going to get in compromising position. And basically, you're going to have one of the Young Bucks tell the ref. It would send people crazy. I'll find you. <laughs> and you count the three. Okay, Sting loses. They get the belts. The nuclear heat happens. But basically... After they win the belts, Sting's sons come in, kick them out, and they give their dad the proper send-off that he yeah. deserves. Could do that as well. Could do that as well. They're all good options. I don't think there's a bad option here, really. 
people no, just want to see Sting one last time. It doesn't really and, matter. And the, and the thing is, we all know Ric Flair is probably going to, in order to make this look viable, screw Sting somehow, some way, somewhere. He's screwing someone over. It, that's the only reason you have Ric Flair there. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You know, uh, and Ric Flair wants to be a part of his retirement farewell match. And what better way to go up? Because, you know, they call you the dirtiest player in the game. <laughs> so why not keep that that title with you? You know, that's why I think, though, the trick is going to be he's doing dirty on the books. He's tricking the books. That's what I'm sticking with. I could be totally wrong, but I'm sticking with it. No, he's no, screw but, the you know, books like, over. no, no, no. You, you have something. And here's the thing is Ric Flair is like the enigma, because after having that meeting, you have no idea which direction he's going to go. Exactly. exactly. It's kind of like... And logic from past would say, of course he's going to screw over Sting. He hates Sting. <laughs> but... Yeah. You know, I mean, you've had these matches in the past where they, they knock each other loopy for God knows, but, you know, you, you want to basically have a good send-off for the icon Sting for all the years he's put in into this industry yeah and you want to make sure that he goes out on a high note regardless on whether he loses or wins uh knowing tony uh there'll be the big pyro there'll be a big fanfare there'll be it wouldn't surprise me if there would be wrestlers that sting knows from other organizations that may come into the ring to basically send them off with his you know good farewell uh, we do know one person that will not be there that wants to be there so bad, yeah. but can't, and that's Kevin Nash because of his uh, agreement he's made with WWE. I understand, uh, you know, he because he, I think he, I think he probably would be allowed, but he knows it would look bad. It, the, and the thing is, is I don't think that Kevin wants to put uh, Triple H in a position, yeah, where you know. It's gonna ruffle feathers with with Triple H being it's, it's, it's the, shame, the new though. the new sheriff in town, and you know if you're gonna let him do it, then that means I have to let other people do it. You know, it's a shame because AEW let it happen the other way. You know, where oh yeah, they had that yeah. video package. Tony, the... Tony has no problem if you have friends in other wrestling organizations to you know to go to their their matches, to go behind the scenes, to do this. He has no problem with this because he knows that you're coming back to work for me. It's yeah. not like you're going to be stolen away. Well, with WWE, they're afraid of, hey, you know, if you go over here, they may talk to you with business and make you a better offer. And I think they so, probably it, would. It, I if, think if, AEW would say, Nash. <laughs> yeah, you know, do you want to be like a, a general manager? You know, kind of like, you know, you know I, but, you know, Kevin's been vocal about it and, he would love to be there, but unfortunately can't. Doesn't mean that other of uh, Sting's friends can't yeah. be there. Uh, one name that pops up that may make an appearance would be Lex Luger. Um, oh, yeah. I haven't thought about that. Uh, Diamond Dallas Page. Oh, DDP I could see because they've had him on the show before, haven't they, in the past? Right. Like... Um, another one that kind of comes in, and I know that DDP is helping him right now, is Buff Bagwell. Yeah. Um, some of the people from Georgia Championship Wrestling or WCW that he's had, you know, great friendships with. Um, I can see these people, you know, camera doing these shots at ringside, and then when the match is over, them all getting in, in the ring and hugging and high fives and 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 whatever. Um, because you want to have thing go out in a fanfare, and you want him to go out with all the pyro and confetti and everything that this man deserves. And, and Tony will pull out all the stops to make sure that he gets it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's bittersweet because I have watched thing from get go. I, that was the first wrestling match I took my daughter to. I, when I was walking and Sting was a part of it and Sting won a championship. And that's when he was surfer Sting with the blonde buzz cut. Oh, whoa. Know, was, yeah. Right. Sure. The, the tan and, and had shoulders and everything, you know, and all the, the recreations of Sting down the road 
has told me one thing is that this man always finds a way to reinvent himself. Mm -hmm. Always finds a way to basically uh, look at things differently and pass on you know advice to the younger talent and have basically utilized them for their talent and and it's kind of like a equal pairing and i think this thing with darby allen with him now is like people joke about apprentice i think what it is is sting is passing on the knowledge of the business to darby allen who basically will take that and go leaps and bounds with it yeah it's, uh, it's, 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 it's really it's, interesting. in a way it's kind of like passing the torch to the younger talent and with everything and all the knowledge this thing has gathered through the years of this industry, you know, it, it's not a waste it, it, if you can pass it on to the right person. And Darby's that right person. And, you know, their friendship is, is, you know, speaks volumes. And something just popped in my head that I don't even want to think about. But oh, no. <laughs> what if Darby screws thing over? Oh, whoa. Whoa. Okay. I hadn't even considered that. I, I don't think he will, but now that now you've planted a seed of thought. <laughs> but, but if the bosses say to do it or you'll get fired, what are you going to do? I think but most people, it would be a dilemma that, but I don't know. Darby seems like the kind of person who'd go to the bosses. Well, screw you. I don't care. Can I like give you a F you? Yeah, I could imagine him doing that. That's his whole vibe, isn't it? But then, well, that might still happen because isn't he planning to take some time off soon anyway to um, like He's climb got, yeah, the, a you, mountain or something? Yeah, the, yeah, you know, and so that could be what they do. They so, fire him I mean, in storyline. If if you want to do something totally unexpected and flip the script, you know, Tony, you never know with with, with him and 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 how Sting wants to do this there's so many different directions and yeah you just want to make sure that when no matter what direction you do it that you make the man look good and to do this with darby man you're talking about leaving a lasting impression that when darby wrestles yeah i'm the guy that screwed sting i'm <laughs> the one that carried the team i'm the one that did everything he did nothing he didn't teach me shit. I taught him. And Darby can be as this wonderful heel persona, gain generate heat. Yeah. Kind of like Dominic Mysterio. And then some, and then form the stable with the Young Bucks. That would be interesting. I don't think it's going to happen, but now there is a, that, that is a possibility I'd never considered. So, oh, or, wow. or, Darby aligns himself with Ric Flair, his nemesis. <laughs> See, that would also so be many, shocking. There is so many directions this can go, but no matter which direction it goes to, I send Sting off in the fanfare he deserves, and nothing more, nothing less. So I, I think mean, the last it, shots are going to be positive. You're going to be happy. I think. You know, and if it goes over your pay-per-view time limit, damn it, let it go. Because this man deserves everything yeah. that you know you can give him for doing everything. This coming from a gentleman that when he was in WWE had this almost career ending injury, come back from it and then comes into your organization and works and basically has helped train the younger talent, have given them his insight on the business, uh, how to conduct yourself, yeah. how to do what needs to be done for your character, how to basically adapt and roll with the punches, how basically, you know, you don't have to win all the time to get noticed, how, how to basically the ins and outs of this business, don't get caught in the pitfalls, you know, don't do completely what I did because when I was younger, I kind of, did some stuff that I shouldn't have, and I'll be the first one to admit things of that nature. When you've got all this knowledge and, and a talent and all these things that you can pass on, that's a gift. 
that is really a gift. And for the younger talent to basically listen to this and with open ears and open mind and to learn from mistakes from an icon like Sting or the yeah. pitfalls and take that under heart and basically run with it to another level, that speaks volumes because, my God, that just you're 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 basically telling that person that I get it. I'm gonna do this. Yeah. Thank you for you know believing in me. Thank you for you know spending some time with me to assist me in what I have to do to order to get that next plateau. You know, and if it wasn't for my interaction with you or the time I spent with you, I wouldn't have known this. I I wouldn't have thought of this. I would have done something different. You know, uh, well, it's an so, interesting pairing as well because of all that stuff. You know, yeah, you know, and I they're mean, very different wrestlers, so it's intriguing to see like yeah. what what is Darby gonna take from Sting and add to, you know, what he does. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's gonna be interesting. You know, I mean, Sting's always gonna be in our minds and hearts. He's mm -hmm. just because he's not wrestling doesn't mean that he's gonna be out of the line. Like I can guarantee you, you'll still have his connections in professional wrestling sports entertainment no oh. matter what organization it is i'm sure he'll you still know, probably um, appear on aw tv in some capacity yeah, you know though. you can you can make sting the goodwill ambassador of sports entertainment yeah you know you uh, and and he can go and make appearances whether it's different sporting events or you know conventions or whatever you know which, which i think I, he is going to do think, because they've been very careful with the language, if you notice. They always say it's his last wrestling match. Yeah. They're not saying he's and, retiring. <laughs> well, here's well, he is retiring in a business sense, but he's not retiring as a person. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, the one convention Blake and I are going to, I believe Sting is making an appearance. There you go. There you go. See? And he's still uh, we've already stuff. we've already have decided that, yeah. We want to get Sting's autograph and photo and then kind of like show Sal, like, look at this. We don't, we don't, you, we don't have the action figure, but we got the five by seven glossy uh, <laughs> and we got to shake hands with the real thing. Devastated. <laughs> there you go. I'd be so crushed he, if my friends showed me that. I'd be like, no, how dare you? He, and, then, and then I can say, you know, so Sting does like me better. Just like Jay Lethal likes me better. <laughs> and on that note, that is the whole card. Uh, yeah. Top to bottom. And. I said, I'm sure it's going to be culminated with a very emotional situation with Sting's last match. And, you know, let's see if Tony comes out. I, I would love to see Tony come out and, you know, and, and, and give the man a hug, give the man a send off. Oh, and, I think he will. Yeah. You know, uh, don't just sit behind the desk and the mic, you know, give him, show him your attention and gratitude for everything he's done for your organization. So. Definitely. Yeah, because he has done a lot. Just that having him there elevated them, you know, to another level. So. Oh, yeah. You basically kind of like, for lack of sense, kind of gave your organization, legitimize it by having him there and interacting with the talent and doing this with different storylines. And I'm sure that Sting had some input on the storylines that he went through. Because otherwise, he wouldn't be doing some of the things he's doing, especially his age where... He's going through tables and climbing up ladders, yeah. and, you know, <laughs> going crazy. underneath the rings and, you know, whatever. I never God, expected any of that. You know, God, God bless him for, you know, he's not that much older than I am. God bless him for able to do that, what he's doing. And, you know, he's got his family and, you know, you want to spend time with the family. That's not a bad thing, especially if you can spend time with your family. Ooh. Just walking into the sunset, that's great. And that'd be great yeah. send-off for him. And God bless. I, I, I want is the best for this man for everything he's done for everybody else. So Absolutely. One of the all-time greats. We love you, Sting. Yep, we do, Sting. And, you know, you're not going to be missed. You're not going to be forgotten. If you think that people are going to do it, I guarantee you. I mean, everyone says, ooh, Ric Flair. How many people are going to go, ah! <laughs> And also, of course, we, we, we are going to be uh, sadly missing out on it's. Uh... 
Antonio. I guarantee you, Tony's gonna be there and give him the biggest hug, and there's gonna be some waterworks and why not, you know? And I can I can see this. I guarantee they're gonna have Tony on play by play, and all of a sudden I can hear Xavier going, "Okay, Tony," and <laughs> and you got Tony going to sting. Yeah, God. I'll miss it. I'll miss it. Also, I, yeah, we all will. We all will. So for more information on our show, including where you can find us on social media or watch the show on YouTube, go to the Blake and Sal Show dot com and don't forget to leave a comment and reading a review and we'll read it on the show. And please, hey, send words of encouragement to Blake. Every little thing helps. Every little thing is was taken to heart. Uh we just want Blake to fight, fight hard, get better, uh, and be back with the best of spirits. And if you give him words of encouragement, I guarantee you, knowing Blake, like I do, and part of the family, he will be so grateful for it, as well as my family being grateful for it. So any type of words of encouragement, even if you basically tell him to say, fight, Blake, fight, I guarantee you, that is going to pick up his spirits, liven his spirits, and give him that wonderful determination and mindset to do that because he is starting right now. And, you know, small steps can lead into big things. And the more positive influence and thoughts, the better the prognosis will be. So absolutely. And now that I've said that <laughs> and, you know, uh, I know sometimes that you got, the sale that has a sound bite said, fuck the kids, fuck Cody Rhodes. <laughs> no, fuck cancer. Yes. So, there you go, Sal. Screw you. <laughs> Screw you, Sal, and fuck there cancer. There you go. <laughs> so, hey, and if you come back next week, Sal, you give me what for, that's okay. <laughs> I take full responsibility. I take what John says, that's on me. So basically, <laughs> if you want to come back and be the bad guy, be the bad guy to me. I can take it. I got broad shoulders. I got yeah. big arms and I can kick your ass. Oh, the match is on. No, it's I signed. <laughs> I can't kick your ass. Your fiance will get upset with me. Never mind. Never mind. Just, <laughs> we'll, we'll be back for our next show with all of us. And hey, John, your plugs, my sir. Plug oh. your product. Yeah, if you want to hear more of me, if you haven't, haven't had enough today, because it's been quite a lot, <laughs> uh, you can find me. Uh, I've got shows Bat Minute, Miami Minute. Hedvig, Inch by Angry Inch, uh, all podcasts. You just look them up. I'm not going to tell you what they're about. I'm on here enough. And um, yeah, just find me on all the social medias, either under John Parker or um, my stage character, Cantina Turner. Um, uh, you can look up either name. I think both work. <laughs> You're just such a quiet celebrity. Oh, I ah, wish. You're modest, modest. Me? Yes. <laughs> Under the dictionary is a picture of you and the word modest is right there. So, yeah. <laughs> so hey, just to let you know that next week will be a special archive show. And then the week after that, all three of us will be back together uh, to talk about the road to WrestleMania. Two nights coming in April, my friend. Two nights, count them. One, two. Just when you think you get tired of one, now we got a second one that comes right back at you. <laughs> so be, be here for that. And as always, it's been your pleasure. And if you happen to have a local independent wrestling organization where you live or preside in, please patronize these people for the business. These are the young men and women coming up in the world of sports entertainment, professional wrestling. They want to show you the entire package, what they can do, their moves, their persona, their gimmick, their promos, the whole kit and caboodle to get that brass ring to a major wrestling organization, but they can't do it if you're not there watching them. And believe me, doesn't matter if it's 10 people, if it's 20 people, if it's 120 people, they appreciate you coming and paying attention to what they can do to get to that next step. But hey, let's all do it responsibly and act like adults. We got one world. Let's treat each other with love and kindness to make that world a better place. Okay. Cause right yes. now sometimes it's a scary place. We just want to make it better and safe. So if you go to, when you go to these matches, 
please make it a safe environment for all to enjoy. And that note, John, my friend, oh. hey, this has been great. I love it. You know what? The boss will leave us in charge again someday. It's our show now. We've taken over. The other two, take All a right. hike. <laughs> All right. Well, if the other two want to come in, maybe we'll let them join. Maybe we won't. And we'll have to see who's in, who's not. But yeah. you know, my friend, you're always welcome here. This is a safe haven for you. This is a wonderful place for you. And you know what? You're a wonderful person and you deserve nothing less. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Okay. And I kudos to you taking the time out to do this. And once again, we love you guys. And whatever you do in life, make the best of it and do it with